try to go just a day before it's time to do install. And I'll walk around the building or walk up the street. I go visit the coffee shops or the music shops, but just to kind of blend into the neighborhood or blend into the scene where I notice what things people are carrying or advertising or posting or what trees in the front of the building or behind the building. I'll tie all those things into my thinking so that the next day when it's time to install, I'll go out and I'll bring a piece of the nature inside and use it as a stencil. So the the place with the nature that's around the building. An artist's capacity to feel the world, coupled with bold creativity and intuition, will always make something extraordinary. Immense powerful art doesn't just happen by accident. It comes from artists living and thinking in this more encompassing way. This orientation signals tremendous maturity and it's not so easily achieved. When I saw William Downs' monumental wall drawings, I just had to find out more. Join me now for this warm and generous conversation with William and learn firsthand how he is thinking, feeling, and ultimately creating a newer, more connected version of the world. Click on podcasts at arttolife.com to see his art and links to see more. He joins me now from his studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Art to Light, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. William, thanks so much for bringing up some time to us. I can't wait to dive into all of your into all your making. Yes, Nicholas, it's a pleasure to be here. Glad that we can make this work today. Yeah. First off, I'm just I love your work and I love uh, the scale of it. And I love I've done a lot of drawing and I always use drawing as a thing to get me into my painting. But I just so impressed with how far you've taken your drawing. I mean, this is primarily what you've focused on recently, right? It's just all these huge wall drawings. It's just amazing. I'm curious about, and you know, we're going to have you, if anyone's listening, can go to the Art to Life website under podcast and you can see William's work and all he's making. But tell me a little bit about why you're using drawing and, and the lack of color in the work. Um, just as a start, I'm just super curious about that. Yes, um, that's a great question. So drawing for me started primarily when I was a a young kid, like that was the first thing that I could do. And then as I grew older, my art teachers and my parents got me into painting. And through that process, I was thinking that, okay, painting is such a production, painting is such a process that you can't do it all the time. So drawing was that thing kept doing all the time when I wasn't at the studio at school or at home in my bedroom. I shared a room with my brother. I would draw constantly and we would go to church on Sundays and we'd be grumpy about going because it'd be early Sunday morning and we were just kind of bored in our mind. So I'm kind of giving like a real backup on it but um, and bring you up to the current state. So in church, I would draw people on my program and that was my way of like occupying that time um, that we spent before going back home and going to the studio. So as I grew and became more and more advanced in my practice and went to college for um, painting and printmaking, drawing was always that key element that made the prints and the paintings um, work. So when I graduated, I thought about what my future was going to be and I was looking at graduate schools and I was thinking how could I separate myself from other grad students because everybody was doing a thing everybody was making a big thing so I thought that I would go back to my early days of just being a little drawing machine so when I got to Mount Royal at the Maryland Institute College of Art I turned myself into this drawing machine and started making 
hundreds of little drawings, um, thousands, and accumulate them and post them on the wall and create these beautiful blankets or quilts of drawings that kind of didn't go together, but once they were all together, they made a story. So from there, I um, graduated and I instantly started teaching drawing. And after that, I was in the foundation department for three years at MICA, Maryland Institute. And there I was like really obsessing and like focusing my dedication to teaching people the practical fundamentals of drawing. And it was because I was afraid that people were gonna lose that touch because they wanna make these big things first without making the drawings to get there. So that's kind of how I occupied my time with like focusing on um, teaching people how to draw. And then, um, let's see, five years ago, I was having a conversation with my father and I told him that I kind of had a small bump in the road and I was trying to figure out what to do next. And before this conversation, I was using color. I was making all kinds of um, marks with all types of medium that made different colors and sounds. So when I was talking to him, he was like, why don't you just go black and white? And I was like, oh my God, I never thought about that. <laughs> so <laughs> wow. When I got back to Atlanta from South Carolina to my studio, I bought a gigantic jug of ink and I just started making these crazy drawings with tools in my mouth, using my feet. The ink would be all over my hand. I would just make these rubbings, my hand, kind of like a David Hammond's kind of print with his face, um, smushed paper. So that's when it just hit me that this is what my next five years is going to be like, maybe 10 years. So, and here we are today. And they went from on the paper to the walls, and now I'm doing unstretched canvases to kind of give them more of a lifespan because the wall drawings, I make them, spend a week or two making them, and then I go back and I paint over them. Like this yeah. beautiful <laughs> love and patience, but yet it goes away. But to me, it's still behind the wall or the paint. So that mm -hmm. is there. So that's kind of a long-winded um story about <laughs> yeah but it makes sense just there's the vitality and and just that it's so the thinking you know it's so the thinking and it, you know when we look when i look at the painting it's so mannered and there's so you know it's it's this long further down the river kind of view yes but what i love about what you're making it's just you know, it's like it's invitation into this world of, and it, it's so personal and, and it feels like you're walking into someone's thinking. It's weird. It's different than walking into a show of paintings. Right. Um, right. And, and that, that is, uh, you know, and I, and I know that you're making these, I know you're not planning these. They just, they feel too fresh. Is that, am I, is that right? So I, I like to tell people that my brain is like this video camera, just recording imagery. And in my dreams at night, sometimes I can't sleep because I'm thinking about an image and how I need to express that. And and observing people and getting their gestures and their body language so that when I do um, get invited to a show and they want me to do a wall drawing, I just press go and it comes right out. God, that's so cool. Yeah, it's like you're... It's like you're prepping all the time. Yes. And unlike me, you know, it's easy to compare my world. Like what I love about what, what your thing is, like you get a show, but it, it's like come to this place and express yourself in our place. Right. Yeah. You know, like I do my things like in private and I try and make them perfect and, and then I ship them to the gallery and then they hang them up and a few people look at it, you know, but I just love the interaction. And you talked about somewhere I was reading or something where you, it's site specific in a way, you know, yeah. t talk about that. That's really different. You know, like it's a museum or it's a gallery, but mm -hmm. you're doing the art there how how do you make it more specific? Like, what is that? How does that affect what you're making? So usually, when I'm thinking about the space that I'm invited to to make work in, I try to go just a day before it's time to do install, and I'll walk around the building or walk up the street. I go visit the coffee shops or the music shops, but just to kind of blend into the neighborhood or 
blend into um, the scene where I notice what things people are carrying or advertising or posting or what trees in the front of the building or behind the building. Uh, I'll tie all those things into my thinking so that the next day when it's time to install, I'll go out and I, I'll bring a piece of the nature inside and use it as a stencil. So the, oh. the, the place with the nature that's around the building. So that's kind of a, a my signature. So like when I was in St. Louis, um, I couldn't really use spray paint inside of the museum. So we had to figure out how to use um, powdered charcoal dust to kind of put the flower on the wall and blow the dust on it so that the ink would take the impression. So I had to figure that one out on the on the fly because um, I'm just so in my toolbox going, okay, this is what we're going to do when we go to Florida. We're going to find whatever tree that's or plant that's close to the gallery or museum, bring it in, spray paint it on there, and then that's going to be the mark. And people who are from that environment, they're going to know that tree because they find it's part of the, the nature environment. That's so cool how you, I mean, you install to you means just open up the creative chain. Like you're, you're creating install is creation. You're just installing your creativity into this building. Yes. And I mean, you guys listening, you got to go check his work out. I mean, it's, these are massive drawings. They're drawings, thousands of square feet of drawings. Like the whole place is drawn. And, and so tell me, I mean, you show up, you don't have a plan entirely, but you're being informed by the place and what you've been thinking about. Do you have assistance to help do this? Or, or do you take a light pencil and draw over the whole space? Or do you just start on the upper left corner where they walk in and begin? I do start in the upper, like, those are great questions because yeah. those are all the things that I'm thinking about when I walk into the space. My last installation in L.A. at East Selena, which is Eva Cimento Gallery, she has a shotgun-style gallery, white floor, and the, the ceiling is exposed. So you can see the rafters and the columns. When I walked in the space, I thought about how the viewer walks in and they go straight to the back. So I wanted to make a drawing that kind of started out really minimal and as you walk through the space got busier and busier and busier and very intense and tangled with all my thorns and i, I knew like at openings the area that people kind of hang out in during openings so i wanted that part of the wall drawing to be the most um dense with a lot of secret little drawings that are hidden in there and some words sometimes to kind of give the narrative um the secrets to the narrative to the viewer but um with that one, thought about the movement with the human going through the space. So another thing that I think about when I'm showing up at the space is how am I going to either do it by myself or I'll bring an assistant. And sometimes, uh, depending on what gallery it is, the gallery assistant will help out. But usually I try to go in myself and accomplish the mission. But if they're too big, my last gigantic one was at Mocha GA here in Atlanta, Georgia. That was, I think, 250 square feet of wall. And I had three assistants on that one. And the way that it worked is I would show up at 10 and work alone until noon or one o'clock. And then all the assistants will come in. And with that, I'll have some areas that I draw with a pencil so that they could fill in the lines. And then I have one student, um, old student, who has been working with me for a long time. So she had the sensibility of my line. So I never um, worried whenever she would come up and help. Those are the two ways that I approach it. If there's a budget or if there's a group activity where the college or university wants to bring in their grad students or undergrads who make drawings to work with me, I always oblige to that because it makes this nice communal drawing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's exciting. It's so cool how the place uh, informs your work. I just, yeah, that's really, and I love the immediacy of it. Talk about relationships. So these drawings, you guys, they're figurative and they're, they're, I'll just tell you what it feels like to me. And then you correct me because this it's relationships, it's people interaction. 
it's about the synchronicities and, and the simultaneous kind of commingling of people, but it, there's this beautiful quality to it. Like it's inviting. It, it's like the world. It's like a, not a utopian thing, but it's, it's real, but it's, it's just highlighting this sort of positive energy. I think for me growing up in a huge family, I was always the observer. Yeah. I love the gatherings of family members who are familiar with each, with each other. So there's this comfort that I'm bringing into my drawings where I grew up in that comfort. Of ah, that's the word. Com- they're comforting. They're reassuring. That's great. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think also activities where a bunch of people are working together, like basketball or yoga, like when there's like everybody's trying to achieve that's what my images are doing. They're trying to achieve something. It's like there's an evolution going on that we're all players in. Like everyone gets to play in this yeah, dance. Exactly. That yeah. really comes through uh, <laughs> with all. Now, one of the things that I noticed, talk about the sense of time, how you expressed the passage of time, future, present, past. How, how does that come into the work? I would say the people that influence me kind of help that time for me. So a lot of my images, there's always this two-headed figure looking past and looking at the future, but it exists presence. So that's me thinking all the people that have influenced me and the people that are in front of me, but I'm not forgetting anyone behind me. So to me, that's the way that time operates. And... I really love watches and clocks, so time is very important to me. I'm never late for anything. My dad was a Marine. He taught me and my brother, always be on time. Time means so much. So when I'm working, <laughs> I'm setting a clock to think about how much time it takes me to do this and that and this and that. And when I'm in a space, I'll know it exactly how much time it's going to take me to execute a wall drawing that could be like 50 feet or 100 feet and i like to think about um timeless in the work so that you don't know if it's night or day or what season it is so sometimes i just remove time so that it's like the suspended moment that the viewer share with the wall drawing yeah 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 you know the capacity the viewpoint of holding presence yes and past and future simultaneously is a position or a mindset of a kind of a heroic thing like a person like that's a that's a big capacity and these drawings and you i mean it's you but that's a lot to hold it's really a, a powerful attribute i think that you have they have that presence they have a there's a, a scale They can hold a lot because you are considering them from all those places. I don't know if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? I do. do. And I'm I'm aware that um, when I'm in that drawing state of mind, because Mm -hmm. I'm the the hero or the character that's making the narrative. And I step back and I, I see myself still there working. So there's like this moment where I kind of go in and out of the the zone. And um, yeah, I think that's what my goal is, what you just said. I love that idea that, yeah, like you're a player in this, you know, it's, it's mythic. This is a, this is the story that you're, this is the hero's journey in a sense, you know, like you're, you're in this and outside of it. And because you can hold that, it makes the experience so much more, it makes the art amazing and it it makes it um, so much more accessible and and it it can help us evolve in a way. And, and, you know, I I try my best to be as honest as possible in the work so that you can see the mistakes and the corrections. I don't edit anything and I just want it to be as vulnerable and alive as possible. So those are also moments of hero just being honest and being vulnerable at the same time. 
Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You are exactly like I thought you would be. It's interesting. You know, I got so much from the from the work and just really looking at it and thinking about it. It's fascinating, right? I mean, I'm sure when you meet people who want you to come in and do an installation or even people who respond to the work, I have found, you know, like how you really like these people, you know, I can see why you'd like want to work with the, yes. you know, there's the grad students or whatever. It's like, it's just going to make this better. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really great. And you tell me a little bit about the role, you know, like you teach and I, and that's how I actually found out about you uh, through a friend of mine told me about you. And then I kept hearing and I looked at your workshops and you know, you're a mentor for a lot of people and you teach. And so what are the things that you teach? Like, what, how do you work with people? Uh, you know, I know a lot of people listening to this podcast are are shooting, are trying to get where you are in terms of how to become more truthful, how to show the vulnerability in the work, how to access their essence. And how do you help do that? I think the first thing that I try my best to draw out of people is comfort and fearlessness. I think when people let go of their fear of making marks and can take direction, I think they make a better artist or they make they find their voice a lot faster when nothing's forced. So I, I'm between a yoga instructor and a drill instructor where <laughs> I'm bringing out all the things that people keep wound up tight in their body because they have this preconceived notion of how they have to make work instead of just letting go and letting the free formness come out of their unconscious state and um, execute these drawing exercises. So that's one thing. I have this I'm like gravity pulling things out of me. I think it really does help when people are trying to achieve something they have fear and they don't want to show their vulnerability, I kind of draw it out of them. And it's just having them express work that is honest. And yeah, I think that's what I do. I try to get them to loosen up and find their inner artist that they keep locked up because they feel so insecure about that. And the the comfort part of this, or the, what may, can make it easy for them, is that you're you're giving them, you're guiding them, you're giving them exercises. Like here, here's this thing. Your brain can get a hold of that, but then in that, you're. Uh, I, so I love how you're. You know, it's like you're speaking to the body. The bo- you're pulling out of the body, the soul, yes. and all that, and then, but you're also speaking to the mind. And I, I have a similar. You know, like I, th- I think there's different kinds of information we give people, and yeah, certainly there's practical making information, and then, but I love how that comfort is the flip side of, you know, like fear and comfort. Those are those are powerful. That's a powerful tension that that can really make amazing art. You know, that tension. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you run, and I run a lot too, and. Tell me about how, and yoga, and how, how do those enter into this for you? Running, for me, it's that time thing where I'm spending time thinking and feeling and breathing and just feeling my body. Like, I'm the only body that's moving, that I'm conscious of. And I think, for me, running gives me that moment to feel all the things in my body, like aches and pains, or I don't run for speed or like health things. I run because it's part of my life. It's it's my, my way of meditating and thinking about art the whole time. Yoga became a interest when a friend um, invited me to her class and I was like, whoa, I, I love this. I'm not going to be like the best yogi in the world, but I think I can do this and bring this into my drawing practice not my daily life practice. So I bring yoga as a way of helping students to kind of find their bodies and feel their bodies and think about their mind and how their feet is, you know, connected to the ground and how their hands can stretch far out and use a tool to kind of draw their body. 
So for me, that's kind of the two things. But running has been a part of my life since I was a kid. And it's been the most freedom that I have that no one can um, take away. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I run and, uh, yeah, I'm not so interested in races per se. But for me, it's this journey thing. Like I'm on this, I'm, I talk about running like moving through landscape. You know, like that's, that yes, is just like yes. one of my favorite things to do. Uh, move through a landscape and there's just something so interesting about it and what and and your art in the way you do it that's it's like a storyboard from a run of mine you know isn't that a trip don't you think it feels like that i mean it's like it's these there's this and then you run around the corner and then there's that thing happening and then there's this other thing but there's this steady rhythm of the foot strike which is like yoga which is like dance and then there's simultaneous all these things kind of happening and it's and i think of my art this way that i'm trying to capture you know like i'm talking to you right now but i'm also hearing the harbor that's going on over there. And then I'm hearing these other, th- like there's many things simultaneously happening, not just one thing. And that feels more realistic right. to me than anything. And and your work has that, you know, where, you know, the arms are reaching out to here, then they go and then there's an interaction and um, which is hard to do with a static thing. It's just a drawing, you know? It is. Yes, it is. I love having that challenge of trying to create that movement or make us stagnant become so almost vibrating in a way. Yeah. And you do that with the distortion of the figures and arms reaching further. And you sometimes add things, you know, I notice you add stuff. Talk about that a little bit. So for a long time, I was teaching life drawing. In life drawing, I was so passionate about teaching students how to build the body so in my work, I'm taking the body apart and recreating a new figure. So I love the idea of stretching things as far as you can stretch them to kind of connect to a new body. I think of Michael Jordan a lot because he's one of the most beautiful NBA players ever. And I slow down his videos sometimes on YouTube to see how his body stretches through like five bodies and how he's so elegant and graceful when he's like moving from one point to, you know, he's in the air for a few minutes, like no other human, but <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at how that body is so um, special. Like he's definitely a very important hero to my work. A lot of the black figures or silhouettes that you see in the work, I'm using him as kind of an inspiration or I'll make a little sketch of his body stretching and, I'll bring that into the composition. But yeah, I I think life drawing was the beginning of me really pushing my investigation into how I could restructure a body and create a new body. Oh, that's so interesting. Now, do you have, are there characters, are there, are there characters that you know in the work that come in, you know, or is it, is it like mythic? Like, well, there's the sort of the gesture and, you know, and then there's the, you know, the protector. I mean, do you think of it that way? Do you have? I do. Um, There's a usual character that's sitting or standing or laying down on his iPhone. And that character has been probably the most recurring character because I'm bringing technology into my composition through that character. And I think about how much time I spend on my iPhone and how that connection to the world is right there so this character is the iphone guy who shows up and he's either photographing or videotaping whatever's happening in the composition did you say he was sitting on his iphone no he's he's sitting he's sitting on another body or he's standing Ah. so i think um in my exhibition in st louis sometimes it hurts that's when it came out that was 2000 19 but he's standing on the head of the figure and he's oh. like videotaping the parade of figures that's walking through i see so it's like the nod to technology that that's always there exactly so it's not a it's no commentary about good or bad it's just no. that 
in a way this this is like a portal to like a much bigger yeah. world yes yeah it's something that kids sometimes are familiar with when they come in to see my work they're like oh that guy's on his phone <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It makes, they can ground themselves in that. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> what are some of the other uh, characters that you, you pull in that you, we, we would see in different installations? There's the guy walking on his hands a lot. Um, oh, I love that. I call him the handstander. Ah, oh. <laughs> tell like, me about him. So his hands are usually are like roots that are trying to, dig down into the ground and keep his body um, either standing or bending the toes and the feet are usually elongated. So he almost becomes like a tree in a way, but um, that's kind of my shout out to um, the yogis who use handstands and headstands um, as a way of practice. So that's one. I love that one. And I usually um, try to keep him, connected with everything. Yeah. God, that's, I love the handstand idea. Well, and from experiencing it, that it's so simple. Well, I'll just walk on my hands, but everything becomes different. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's all the same, but it's very, very different uh, for that 25 seconds that I can do it. But I love that you have that it's like these are the opportunities to experience this work or yourself. And this guy should always be that. We should always, it's like we should have people standing on their hands in board yeah. meetings in all corporations. I think we, things would improve. I agree. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious does shadow, darkness, um, you know, that show you said sometimes it hurts? Like, talk about that, how shadow your shadow shadow collective shadow is in the work so i think the silhouette takes takes the shadow um part very literal and um when that character became part of the work a friend of mine walked in front of a light that was on the floor of my studio and i was like hey can you go back for a second and his shadow was on the wall so i sketched out his shadow and i was like that's it i'm gonna bring in the silhouette that's that's gold so that's where the shadow came wow. part and i feel like i'm always looking at how shadows lay on the ground or lay on the wall but they become characters and i think when your shadow becomes a character it's kind of like your ego or your other self in a way so that's what that means to me um in a lot of the drawings yeah that, it, that it's you know, it's the unseen part or the unintentional part that comes in. Do you know what that, have you been surprised at what, you know, what you see in this that maybe is, you know, hard for you? Like what's hard for you in, in this work, you know, that, that you're showing that maybe you didn't intend to show, but there it is. You know, that's a good question. And I, I never think about what's hard because I'm constantly the maker and making things. And I think when an image does touch somebody, that's when I think about the hardness or I think about the feelings behind what I've drawn, that it triggered something in someone that they felt. And I think that's kind of the hard part. I think also, I don't know what's hard. And I feel like I'm such a in the moment worker that I forget about my place. I think about others and what I'm trying to get them to feel or their thoughts. So I don't think about that um, in that way. Yeah. You just, you're just so focused on the, the moment of just making this and not like, there's no vulnerability here for you. You're yes, just, making, just making, which is pretty, uh, that's a great place to get to, you know. And, you know, it took a long time to get to this place. And I feel like the last three years has been the best three years of my art life. And I think it's found something that the voice that you, you don't know when that voice is going to come. But when you find it and you listen to it, I think that's when the magic happens. But it takes a lot of, you know, problem solving and a lot of vulnerability basically to find that voice. Yeah. And that, that might be, 
the hard part, right? You know, is listening <laughs> and paying attention, you know, just that. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's I question. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Oh, it's so interesting. So what's coming up for you that like, where do you, where is this going? Like, do you have a sense of what are you excited about? Um, now see, I'm excited about a few things. I just moved into a new studio and I'm making bigger pieces than I've ever made on canvas. So that's what I'm really excited about. I'm really thinking about the monumental scale that Arbaggio has and Carrie James Marshall. Like those two heroes are, are important for me right now. So I'm really excited about studying their compositions and thinking about my compositions more now in the um, canvas pieces, because those are things that people will be able to take with them. The wall drawings are the sp- the spaces where people go and just fall into and use them as these moments of um, kind of like if you are going to church or going to a place where you're feeling your spirit, canvases kind of replace a small glimpse of that. You know, one of the things that I know a lot of people struggle with is working at scale and, and how to create that monumental feeling, no matter how big you're working. And how do you approach a you know, 10 foot by 25 foot wall or canvas or whatever, like, how do you grok that? And how do you, how do you do that? Or how do you think about scale and keeping it? So you, to fill that space, you have to be super expansive in approaching it. I'm just wondering how you get that into that place. So the first thing that I do, no matter what gallery or museum or how big, the first thing that I do is I take a carpenter's pencil and I stretch as tall as I can stretch, and I walk through the whole space, and I create this horizon line that separates the two divisions. And with that, it already gets rid of the fear and the the questions of how am I going to accomplish that scale? But if I divide it into that portion, I have it. It's already started. And then I just think about how the the landscape is going to encompass the different figures, and whatever story that's on my mind as I experience the space and the place, that's when it comes out. Wow, that's great. You know, I always, the way I describe it for people, you know, is because I, what I do is I take a mark brush or whatever, and I, I go to all the places that I can't, you know, it's like a dog when a, a dog comes to your house and you have this big yard that's fenced they always go to all the corners, you know, they like go over there and take a piss and then they run down there and then they go here. And, you know, like you want to just, what is the space first of all? So I just love that idea of just, you're basically like marking it. This is my world. Then there's, there's the ground and then there's the air and all my things are in this space, but just that, that's a really, uh, that's lovely how you, how you do that. That's really cool. <laughs> One thing I noticed, and I, I was just curious that in your, in your pictures, you're really conscious of the distribution of dark and light abstractly. I mean, like it's, it could almost be like a sound diagram of a musical score, the way that heavy darks are measured and they strike here and then here, then there's a cadence and there's a whole rhythm. You know, I know you're thinking that, but how do you think about the distribution of potency using the contrast and the, and the strong darks and all, all of that? Or do you think about it? Is it just intuitive? I, I think about it. It started intuitive, but then in that um, intuitiveness, I had to be aware of it so that I could recreate that every time. I think about how musicians operate when they're writing music and how they create sound through different instruments. So for me, that's how I um, approach it. I have a soundtrack either playing or one that's in my mind that's matching up with the lights and the darks. And, um, And usually when I'm trying to, when I want drama in the work, there's a heavy lines and there's a lot of things that are cluttered and then when i'm wanting to make it kind of peaceful and um delicate and light the lines get lighter and looser and more whimsical so i want that experience to you know penetrate the eyes and the ears when a viewer walks into the space uh yeah no that's so great it's just such a 
it's just this map of, of yourself, you know, that we get to experience. It's really, really great. Well, listen, in, in closing, I just curious, you know, you're holding a lot and this is maturity and, you know, I just, I could see your capacity is really big. And I don't know if that's even, I'm even articulating it right, but it makes, it makes really important work and, and, and work that connects with a lot of people. And, and it's powerful. Can you like, it's speaking to folks that are artists that are developing this, can you speak to like something or a way that, that it was helpful for you to, to get to this place? You know, like what was a powerful thing or a powerful idea maybe that you've had that people can sort of ruminate on who are trying to, to gain this dexterity that you have, um, that you demonstrate in, in your work and in your life. Yes. The way that I'm obsessed with what I make helps, mm. keeps me moving. And I, I try my best to tell young artists to be obsessed with what you're making because the more you become obsessed with it, the better you're going to be challenge yourself because the more challenges, the, the more, um, you stay on your game in a way and the hungrier you are, the more, um, things come to you and your work feeds that. So, yeah, it's the appetite, right. You know, to just, just like go into it and then go into it more and then let that fill it and then keep going back and keep coming back. Yeah. I, I see this, you know, I talk to a lot of artists and, this is the thing. It's the participation with it. You know, it's a constant conversation. I love it. Be obsessive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's we're we're told that that's a negative. Right, exactly. But this isn't. This is this is just what it looks like because in the results of that, you get to translate it and then other people can can access it in the work. So, I think also that access just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The heart work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It grows, right? This thing's growing. Like you're just this little guy that's kind of like doing its thing. But as you, your capacity gets bigger, the work gets bigger, the audience gets bigger, the momentum gets bigger. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you're not totally in control here, but you're only can be in control of your little being that's creating this. Yes. And, and that's, that's really awesome. <laughs> Yes. Well, listen, thank you so much for sharing some of your time. It's uh, your, your work's an inspiration. You're an inspiration. And I um, encourage those folks who are listening to go have a look at his work. There's all kinds of links uh, for people to find you. But um, super appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And your questions are making me think now. I'm ready to go to the studio. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Bye.